This is a real nice cutaway view of what's known as a very old style double end thrust. The predecessor of a double end thrust is what's known as a, as a button thrust. I wish I had a cutaway view of a button thrust for you. But there, were, there was a time when ball bearings weren't even invented yet or successfully for our type of machinery. And they have a series of hardened steel plates and brass bronze shims in between, a series of them, off to one end or sometimes on both ends. And they would su successfully act as a thrust bearing. Um, it was revolutionary when uh, some of the manufacturers developed this double end thrust because it was so much more efficient a lot quieter, would last a lot longer. Um, in its time, it was revolutionary. It was fantastic. Problem was that when you had to, somewhere down the line, replace those bearings, you had to remove the whole worm shaft in order to replace them. Um, but in its day, it was a revolution. It was, it was fantastic. There are still machines today, and there's a very small worm that I use as, as a demonstration that has big bosses on the end of it for a double end thrust. And, and they still operate today. Um, the, the, the technology changed uh, because they made, they made a, better, um, a better style of that bearing. The better style being, and I'll show you in, with this drawing, was that they incorporated a double acting thrust on one end, which would be this style. They encased the whole bearing on the back end of a traditional machine of where the thrust bearing is today so that it was double acting. Rather than having two sets of bearings on each end of the shaft, they incorporated it all on one thrust end. And the beauty of that was, in its time, was that you could change the thrust bearings without taking the worm out. Uh, it probably could be done in a matter of hours rather than a matter of days, OK? So it's, it's just the, the time. It was the technology at the time. As, as things evolved, uh, they try to improve on it. And, and that's how we, we have single end, double acting thrust bearings today. Now, if you notice, this is the oldest style type bearing, where you have a, uh, a set of balls and plates and what have you. And it really relied on a lot of the skill of a maintenance mechanic to go out there and set the thrust bearings. They'd go in with, with, by packing them and, and doing certain things on the bearings in order to get some of the thrust play out. OK? By today's standards, <coughs> we see more typically this style thrust bearing, where you have a double row of bearings, all encased in one housing. And, by, and, and today, all we really have to do is just go buy another, another bearing somewhere, put it in, put the machine back together without really putting too much attention on setting it, because it's all basically pretty much preset, unless there's some, some other problems there. It's pretty much preset, or pretty, pretty full, pool, hmm, foolproof that it is going to work out all right. OK? And we have commercial bearings. We don't have to worry about manufacturers making bearings. Uh, there was a time when some of the major manufacturers made their own bearings. They couldn't buy them. They actually made them. That's how much dedication was in this industry, how proud people were in, in, in manufacturing. So um, this also shows a, a, a very nice view of a what we often in, in New York call the heads of the machine. I think out here you call them bonnets, a uh, very common term. Okay, in, in this particular case, we have a big, long cast iron bonnet supporting that worm shaft. And certainly we have it here on the packing gland as well. This is probably a 1940 vintage machine, by the way, that we have a, a view of. Um, these long protruding parts that come into this assembly served a few different functions. Number one, it gave the worm shaft a lot of rigidity, gave it a lot of support, but it also caused a bit of a, a, bit of a problem, and that is that these, these particular um, areas show an oil port. And the only way that this would work properly is that you have a steel shaft in a cast iron housing. And unless you have constant lubrication or flood lubrication in, in, that, circum in that situation, you would almost for sure freeze up or lock up those, th that shaft onto the head. Well, very often with these older machines, those, those oil ports get blocked up with sludge. Once again, changing oil. Actually, I should be involved with selling oil. <laughs> but um, these particular ports will clog up. 
and often do, and allow this to start wearing. Or if, if the fits are, are big enough, uh, it'll just allow it to accelerate the, the wear process. If the fits are very good and it's blocked up with oil, it'll almost for sure freeze up on you or lock up. And we, we, we have the term that we use, frozen heads. Uh, the machine has a frozen head. Uh, very often, um, uh, in a situation like that, the machine will lock up. And we've seen people where they'll put a big Stolson wrench on the end of the worm and crack it loose and get it running again, but all of these surfaces are all pitted up and, and worn and what have you. Yeah. There is really no way of knowing that. Usually, if you can, um, it's hard to even pick up the noise and where it's coming from because it travels throughout the whole worm shed. You could have a bad motor bearing and it sounds like a bad thrust bearing. I've seen situations like that or, or experienced that as well. It's very difficult to detect. Um, they sell some beautiful handheld vibration meters that really will tell you or give you a good indication that where the source of the of the uh, noise or vibration is coming from, uh, whereas your ears and your senses are not able to do that. But if you put it in the back where the thrust bearing is, it'll come up with vibration. But putting it in the spot that, that it's emitting the, the vibration, it'll, it'll show it up in a higher scale. Okay? Um, I, d I don't profess to go out and buy one of these things, but certainly that would be able to, uh, to pinpoint where it's coming from. <clears throat> no, no, it won't. Okay. Um, ball bearings being very efficient, okay, the machine will operate maximum efficiency. We try and get the best efficiency out of worm geared machines. People want us to go a thousand feet a minute with a worm geared machine and it has limitations but we can certainly be very efficient by using ball bearings and roller bearings and that's I think what's led designers to go with those. Uh, also cost factors, you, you know, ball bearings today, uh, the market is flooded with them. The cost factor is certainly a, a very uh, big factor. Um, you can just physically buy a bearing, put it in place, and uh, assemble a machine a lot quicker than you can with uh, possibly a, um, a bronze sleeve or a, uh, a, long, a long babbitt bearing, whatever. What Otis did throughout the years, from my experience dealing with them, is that throughout the years they may have changed and upgraded bearings. For instance, we went from an old style for instance, this older style bearing, such as this, okay, was on a particular machine. Let's say, for argument's sake, a number one machine. Well, 20 years down the line, they're still making that one, number one machine with a modification in it or, or a revision in it. What Otis would do is, after specking out what machine it is, they would come up with a kit that would give you new housings, give you new packing glands, new worm and gear, and you're taking that old gearbox and transforming it into a new, newer style machine. Um, it's been Titan's ability to take the old original bonnets or heads and upgrade them, but it requires us to have you physically remove them, send it to us, we'll make you uh, a new replacement gear, and upgrade the heads. Uh, for instance, this particular first worm shaft had a double end thrust in it. The replacement incorporated a new single end thrust, and we did all the modifications in the shop. Um, and we're able to do that in a very timely manner. It's something that's a constant uh, situation in our shop. Okay, worst case scenario, two weeks. Okay, uh, depending of course on the size of the machine if we've made them before, but it's usually within two weeks we can produce from scratch a new replacement worming gear and, and do some upgrading. Uh, there are situations where there are very common machines that we see a lot of and we might have the replacement gears right in stock. Uh, certainly there are a lot of Otis machines, there are a lot of uh, Westinghouse machines. Uh, we've seen uh, repeats of a lot of this equipment. Uh, we'll have them right on the shelf. So that is a circumstance that we can produce it fairly quickly. Let's talk about one other thing. How about lost motion again? Couldn't lost motion be, con be a contributing factor when there is excessive play in these bonnets. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but certainly if you have some rocking action where that worm is, it will contribute to lost motion. It will also give that shaft uh, some allowance to move, which would affect the motor coupling, the brake pulley, a whole series of components that are supported, but believe it or not, by this 
by this whole line or this, this whole assembly. So uh, one of the most common things that we, we find is that uh, people take an older machine, put a new motor on it, new brake, new motor, not uncommon, upgrade the control, still use the old gearbox. Well, after a number of years, there's been a lot of play inside this particular area. Same thing on the motor, uh, maybe even on the coupling. Go and put it all back together again, and the new motor is nice and tight, and the new coupling is nice and tight, everything is nice and tight, and you've got all this slop in this area, and before you know it, you snap a shaft. Uh, so it, it really is important that when you go and inspect and take a look and upgrade some of this equipment, that very easily you can take a look and, and see whether or not that, uh, uh, that area is, is still very supported or, or what have you, if there's any wear in it. <clears throat> if you might remember, we just had this up as an illustration. If you notice what the title says, pre-1925 style thrust bearings, you can it certainly dates the time when uh, we use that style thrust bearing. There's still a lot of them operating today. From that evolved a modern style thrust bearing. You'll see two different views very quickly. This particular type here shows a, um, a duplex bearing, angular contact, uh, and held in place with a thrust nut or a double thrust nut, which is the more modern way of, of uh, that you'll see on modern equipment, these uh, commercially available thrust nuts. And uh, those thrust nuts put pressure on the inside race of these bearings and contain it up against the shoulder of the shaft. And we also have this area here, which represents the thrust cover. And by putting pressure on the outside race right in this portion here, also locks up the outside races of those bearings and contains it. And that's a double acting, double acting style thrust. This is the more modern con uh, conventional type that you'll see on machines today. And there's little variations from every manufacturer. Um, this also, this other view shows a style using our friends again, the taper roller bearings. This happens to be for a very heavy freight application where the, um, the thrust is being contained by a series of taper roller bearings. And if you might see, there's just nothing more than a, a cap that's, contain that's holding these two thrust bearing races, the inside races, together. Usually that cap is held in place with some um, large bolts going in the center of the shaft to contain those bearings right up against the uh, shoulder of the shaft. And again, the outside thrust cover is holding on the outside races. Okay.